Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, and we're, we're plodding through it. We went through verses 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 last time, and we're going to start in verse 20 uh, this evening. But to introduce that 20th verse, I want to remind you that if you read or listen to the news with a biblical mind, you can often hear the whisper faintly in the background of truths from the Bible that are, are just coming through the secular, unbelieving news outlets. Let me, let me just share one uh, summary I read this week. This, this was fascinating. They said this, and it was to prove something, but they said, humans can live 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, but only one second without hope. I thought that was a very interesting and insightful comment. You see, we live in a world that brings hopelessness to people's lives. The scriptures tell us why they're hopeless, but, but let me talk about some of the reasons that people don't have hope. Most adults in this world, no matter where they live, a couple weeks ago we spent 12 days in Turkey and Greece. I listened to a Turk and a Greek talk all the daylight hours. And you know what I found? It doesn't matter where you live. You have the same set of struggles. A little different form, a little different sound, a little different color, a little different shape. Same form of struggles. I listened, and it's the same thing. Job insecurity, health insecurity, and uncertainties, financial distresses, future fears. Like, what's the world going to be like for my children? Or what's the world going to be like for me when I'm old? Or what's the world going to be like, period, when I'm weak and whatever? These future fears, everyone seems to have them. And then you add to that relational woes. And it's just amazing to hear of, you know, whether it's in a Muslim society or a Greek Orthodox society, their relational woes. And then the general struggles that accompany life. I mean, it's hard. Life is hard. I mean, getting up, going to work, fixing stuff, never having enough time, just life is hard. And all of these wear on our hopes for the future. So whether you're saved or lost, they're just the... The general struggles of life. But beyond just the normal how hard life is in every way, there's kind of a second layer that, that robs us of our hope. Because lurking all around us are these deadly diseases. You hear about people getting them. And then there are these incurable and killer viruses. And you don't want to get those. Especially you heard this week that they were FedExing uh, actually, it was last week. They were FedExing this, this only known strain of deadly Spanish flu, and they sent out thousands of samples of it to labs to test. You know, and then they recalled them all. And, you know, and you hear about all these incurable, deadly viruses. And then there are lethal pathogens that, if released and unrestrained, could devastate all of human life in this world. Now, for a recent example, the avian or the bird flu that still, I mean, that thing has not gone away. They're just working on it. And it's just villages in Vietnam right now are being struck and people are, are dying of this horrible disease, but it hasn't broken out of that area yet. So that's kind of a second level that kind of robs people. I mean, if you can make it through your job and your future plans and your retirement and have enough finances and good enough help, then you got to worry about, you know, these kind of mid-level disasters, and I could add to that earthquakes and tornadoes and all the other, other things in life, but even more ominously in the background, and this is only in the last 60 years, there's something else that's back there. Not only the, the terrorists, which is a new thing in our society, uh, and the, the dirty bomb that, I mean, last week they said that that Zarqawi has one that he's in a process of assembling somewhere here in America. And everyone says, who's Zarqawi and how'd he get it? And, you know, I mean, but it's out there. But even more horrible, we've forgotten this one. We don't even think about this one. Atomic weapons being unleashed again on this planet as they haven't been for 60 years. You know, we just celebrated uh, and we'll celebrate again, you know, the, the end of of the war 60 years ago and, you know, or, or it was 50 and then now this year it's going to be 60 in June, the, the, the whole end of World War II. And then this 
coming August, we're going to talk about 60 years ago, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. 60 years, no atomic weapons detonated on this planet. But weapons of mass destruction, if properly understood, will just kill your hopes for the future, especially if you don't know Christ. Well, because of these layers of problems, more and more people around the world are coming to the point of hopelessness. In fact, I was sharing with a group that I spoke to this week that the, the new way in Japan of getting rid of your problems is, you know, Japan is just about as advanced and as affluent as you can get on this planet, and they've tried everything, done everything, all by the time they're 19 years old, and there's nothing left to live for, and they're in great debt, and they have no hope for the future. So they, they have these parties. They go in their fancy new Japanese car. They buy a little hibachi oven. They sit in their fancy car. They, they in their fancy... Uh, Lexus, they have this roll-down thing, and they put the hibachi there. They cook their meal inside the car with the windows up, and they have this wonderful meal. They all eat it, as many as can fit in the car. They leave the hibachi burner going. They all get a little sleepy, and they die of carbon monoxide poisoning in the car, just like that. And there's a Japanese unpronounceable to us word for this. It's a party death, ending their life in their fancy car with their fancy hibachi because they have no hope. I was interested, the British paper was, uh, BBC News was talking about, this was the headline, Germany's Great New Depression. And I thought it was about finances, you know, the Great Depression. It's about their feelings. I'll just read two lines from it. This is the headline. Record numbers of Germans suffering from depression and other mental illnesses. Second line. Up to 70% of Germans say they are seeking professional help for their psychological problems. And if you read the article, you know what it is? They're so afraid they're going to lose their job. They're so far in debt. And they, they just have nothing to live for that they are, they are too sick to go to work the job they're afraid they're going to lose. And they're too depressed they can't even go into their job that they're afraid they're going to lose because of life being too hard. Well, look at Matthew 24 because the horrible reality is the worst is yet to come. You might think it's bad now. The worst is yet to come, Jesus says. I mean, what a, what a negative sermon from the most positive man in the world. The worst, he says, is yet to come. It's ahead of us. This is where... Jesus takes us this evening. Let me just back up with you because we, we already covered verses 15 uh, down through 20. But I want to I wanna remind you of this because as we plod through this 24th chapter, it's a masterpiece. It's, it's the best, most perfect sermon on the future ever preached because it was preached by the one who is bringing the future to pass. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't hypothetical. It was him telling us what he's doing, our Lord himself. But, but look what he says in these verses. First, he shows us uh, that when he comes back, the Jews are back in the land after 2,500 years. Remember we covered that last time? For 2,500 years, there has not been a sovereign nation by the name of Israel. When he comes back, there, there is in the land where they used to live a group of Jews uh, after 2,500 years. They have a temple I told you about last time in Jerusalem after 2,000 years without a temple. So 2,500 years without a nation, 2,000 years without a temple, and on top of that, they're offering animal sacrifices. And by the way, they haven't had animal sacrifices for 2,500 years either. They didn't do animal sacrifices with Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and all that because once the temple was destroyed in the time of Nebuchadnezzar and Solomon's temple was the last functioning animal sacrifice offering in the complete sense of the Mosaic law. Why? Because what was missing? What was missing in the time of Christ was that there was not a believing priesthood. That's why Jesus so condemned them. So though they were offering all the different, they were just going through it mindlessly, and that's what Jesus Christ's ministry was. So there was not a believing offering going on that last 500 years even after they rebuilt the whole thing. Well, Jesus tells us this, and let me read it to you. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, verse 15, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. So that hasn't, 
There hasn't been a holy place for 2,000 years. There hasn't been a, a sanctified holy place where the Shekinah dwelt because Ezekiel saw that leave. The glory left. God's presence left. That's why there weren't genuine sacrifices going on there. It was just a, just a rigmarole going on. It left way back. Way back. 2,500 years ago. But it's going to come, the building at least is going to come back. And he says, verse 18, let those who are in Judea flee in the mountains. That means they're living in, in Israel and they're called Judea. And, and there's a, Judah hasn't existed for 2,500 years. Uh, let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. He said, this is urgent. He who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Now look at how Jewish this is. Verse 20. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Do you know why this is a message to the Jews and not to us? Do you know why this talks to us about a future time? Because it's so postured around Jerusalem. It's surrounding the temple, the sacrifices, Judea, and the ultimate is in verse 20. Pray that it not be on the Sabbath. The Sabbath? What's the Sabbath? It has nothing to do with us. This is a Jewish section. So Jesus speaks to them. Well, we covered that last time. Now look at verse 21. And that's where we're going to go tonight. Because Jesus introduces a new topic. He changes gears. And this is what he says. He says at the time when he returns, listen, mankind is finally possessing the capability of total annihilation of life on this planet. I want that to sink in your mind. Because it's just flown past us. We, we don't even think about that. And we need to think about that. Verses 20 and 21. For then, this future time, when he returns, there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now remember, Jesus' sermon is drawn completely from pieces of of the fabric of the prophecies of the Old Testament. We're going to look at a lot of those tonight. Jesus was preaching and expounding on what he had already said through his prophets, what he had said. Peter said it was the Spirit of Christ which was in the prophets speaking. It was Jesus speaking through those prophets. The Spirit of Christ, impelled by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but it was the Spirit of Christ that was speaking through them because he was revealing himself as the Christ. And so he said it's going to be like never before. But look what it is. Verse 22. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. As a very ominous statement. Especially when you interleave verse 22 with all these other prophecies that Jesus alludes to, which we're going to see tonight. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened You know, I described this snapshot we're looking at tonight is this. When Jesus Christ returns, when he comes back to earth in his glorious second coming, what the earth looks like at that moment is possessing, and I might add, using weapons that cause mass destruction at such a rate that if it wasn't stopped, it would kill every human being on this planet. The worst is yet to come. Hopelessness. You haven't seen anything yet. That's what Jesus is saying. Well, let's bow and ask him to open our hearts tonight. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word, and I thank you we get to look at it, and I thank you we get to compare Scripture with Scripture, and I pray that you would illumine and quicken us. And more than becoming experts in more facts, may this backdrop that we see in your sermon of hopelessness, no hope for the citizens of this planet in this horrific time, point us to hope that comes to us in your word. And may we become experts in biblical hope. And may our lives be governed by you, the God who gives us hope. No matter when in life we live, no matter what layer of troubles we're going through, whether the everyday problems or those greater problems or even these horrific problems, may we live in hope. And we'll thank you for what you do through your word, by your spirit, in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Well, we've started saying these words these days. What words are those? Weapons of mass destruction. You hear people say it. I mean, it's not even alarming to hear it on the news. I mean, we heard it so much during the Gulf War and then during the aftermath of the Gulf War. We, it's kind of like over, we've been overexposed to it. It's like everything else in our society. We're so overexposed to stuff, we're deadened to it. Let me talk to you about what weapons of mass destruction mean. We often have no idea how sobering that concept should be. God says at the end of the world, mankind will be capable of destroying all of human life. So he's going to cut this short. You know, God is involved. Yeah, he's sending all these plagues and everything. But wait till you see what man is doing. It's, it's staggering. You know, the fact that mankind will be capable of destroying all of life is exactly what WMDs mean. We have reached a point 60 years ago where finally mankind possessed in his arsenal something so powerful, so damaging, so big that it it was far beyond the scope of anything that earth has experienced prior to that time in the hands of mankind. Consider that when Jesus made this prediction, the armaments of his day were swords and spears and bows and arrows. Okay? There was no possible way that anyone on this planet could have enough swords, bows, arrows, and soldiers and time and food and money and ships to transport them to all the various places to wipe out a quarter, a third, a half of the world's population and certainly not all of it. There's just no way. There wasn't enough time. I mean, you, you could hack all day long, and there aren't enough armies, there aren't enough people, and besides that, people could run off and hide and, and escape in boats and do whatever. It just was impossible. Never could all of human life have been snuffed out. Now think just of one. I'm not going to get into biology and everything, but just think of the easy one, atomic weapons. Tonight, there are tens of thousands of atomic weapons on this planet. Tens of thousands. I mean, we possess the most here. And we sometimes don't even know where they all are, okay? Uh, There's so many. But these are deployed, they're coiled, and they're ready to strike, not just here, but all across the world, these weapons are. Each of these devices would immediately incinerate any human life close enough to be in range of the fearsome, destructive power, okay? But if you don't get it at the first, if it's not just the the explosion that gets you and that initial burst of, of radiation, the lingering effects, both in the air and in the ground and in the water would slowly get you. So, so I mean, it's just, it's just very, very deadly. And slowly or swiftly, lives with lingering or immediate radiation-induced death. In these two verses, Jesus has fast-forwarded us, forwarded us to the end. He's played the tape all the way to the end. And in these verses, he says, this is what is happening. It's far worse than we realize. Tonight we need to see where Christ's words come from. Okay, I want you just to back up and I, and I want you to, to see the, the allusions he's making. So let's go back to Daniel 12 and we'll, we'll back up through the Bible. Okay, Daniel 12 is where we'll start and we'll back up toward Isaiah. And Daniel, verse 1 of chapter 12, is exactly, by the way, Daniel is one of the key books. That's why Jesus cites him by name. If you want to know who's important in prophetic literature, in Matthew 24, Jesus says, like Daniel said, and I hope you understand when you're reading what he's saying, because Daniel was the key prophet that, that laid out the framework for all this. That's, it's, not, it's not the chart makers and the prophecy book people that made the, the, the framework. It's God through Daniel. He made a very clear framework, and we've already covered that the last uh, few verses of chapter 9, saying that this period is going to last seven years. Tim LaHaye didn't think of that, and neither did Hal Lindsey or any other prophetic buff. It is from the Bible that it's going to be seven years long. It's punctuated in the middle, and the bad part is the last half. That's all in the Bible. Now look at chapter 12 of Daniel. At that time, and this is, this is 
picking up on, on chapter 11. The chapter divisions weren't in the Bible. It was the continuous scroll. And so he's continuing the idea of chapter 11 and the glorious land being invaded and all that. That's in verse 41 and onward. But at that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Again, who is this directed toward? The Jewish people. This is Daniel, a prophet of the Jewish people, a Jew himself. Speaking of Michael, who, as it were, is the guardian of the Jewish people. He is the one that Satan has a desire to snuff out the Jewish people because through them came the oracles of God and the promises of God. And through them, the the prophecies were made by the Jewish prophets. And through them, the Messiah was coming. So Satan wanted to get rid of them. And through them, the Messiah came and all the Messiah's promises are connected to those people. And he says, I have attached my name to those people and to this land and it's my land and I'm going to end history here and I'm going to have my people build a temple to me in this land and when that temple is defiled and in the midpoint of the tribulation when this abomination that causes desolation this man of he's a prince of the people who destroyed Jerusalem that's what Daniel 9 says the Antichrist is going to be Roman isn't that amazing I could go into other stuff. You talk about something unnerving, and I'm not into Roman Catholic lore. But did you know in the 12th century there was a Roman Catholic pope that made a prophecy about every pope that would follow him? He described them. And you know what's just eerie? You can see everything he said. I mean, if you look close enough, he said this one would be born at the eclipse, and this one would be born at this and that. And you know, it all has basically happened. But you know what the eerie thing is? He said that from his papacy on, there would only be 112 more popes. And this new guy, Benedict XVI, is the 111th. And you know what this man in the Middle Ages said the last pope would be? Probably he was reading Daniel. He said he will be a Roman. And he will end the church. Now, this guy in the 10th, 11th century believed that the last pope And it could be that he was reading the scriptures, but he prophesied, wrote down in Latin, cryptic little sentences that said the last pope would be Roman. We know for sure the Antichrist is of the people that destroyed Jerusalem, Roman. It doesn't mean uh, a resurrected dead Roman. It means of the ancient Roman Empire's region. And as we saw last time, basically that's Europe. Okay, keep reading to to what he says. There will be, he says, this Michael will arise because this is the crucial time the Jews are close to being exterminated. He arises. Now listen to what verse 1 continues. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. What he's saying is this is the worst time in history. What did Jesus say in in verse... um, 21 of Matthew 24 I just read there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world to this time Jesus said this is the greatest worst time why I thought the flood was no the flood wasn't a great tribulation that was a rapid death of everybody this is a lingering long horrific three and a half years from the the midpoint onward of what I shared with you in January would be like having three tsunamis uh, every, uh, you know, three in the morning and three in the afternoon every day around the world with hundreds of thousands of people dying every day. That's why it's the greatest. Look, look what it says in verse 1. It's the greatest time of distress, Daniel 12, 1. Nothing like that has happened from the beginning of nations. It's the worst time in history. But at that time, your people... Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Now, again, to to keep consistency here, it's talking about the remnant of the Israelites and that they, at that climactic moment when the city is broken through, as we saw last time, and the armies are marching in and they're pillaging and ravaging and raping and, and murdering, the Lord touches down on the Mount of Olives. And it's going to be a fearful time because finally he's going to unleash his wrath, and that's what chapter 19 of Revelation is all about. Well, let's back up, because uh, if the tribulation, the last half is the worst time in history, what's going on? And let's go back to Isaiah 24. I think it's interesting that Isaiah 24 exactly parallels 
Matthew 24. Now, I know that's just a, a coincidence. For this reason, the chapter divisions weren't in the Bible. But I'm glad that the people that divided up the chapters made it so it's easy to remember. Okay, so Isaiah 24, Matthew 24, both are talking about the tribulation. Because Isaiah foresaw something that Jesus affirms. Now, what Isaiah foresaw under the inspiration of God's Spirit, Jesus confirms in this sermon of his. And which in turn... If we read these words in, in, in 24 and then back in chapter 13, it should send collective shivers through our hearts as we think about what he's saying. Because a lot of times we get so caught up in, in, in kind of the popularized version of this, which is, you know, we just eat this stuff up. You heard Ken Ham say during the seminar that, that millions of people, all of us, love these prophetic books. We just eat them up, you know, and, and that's why LaHaye sold so many. But we don't sometimes really know the scriptures that lie behind them. Look, here's one, 24 of Isaiah, verses 1 through 6, okay? Because I want you to think of your neighbors and friends without Christ's love and hope, without his cleansing and forgiveness, what they're going to experience if this kicks off anytime soon. Isaiah 24, 1, Behold, the Lord lays the earth and this is, I'm reading from the New American Standard, very similar to New King James. Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, scatters its inhabitants. Drop down to verse 5. The earth also is polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth. And those who live in it are held guilty. And this is the most critical part. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Now listen. And few men are left. Now wait, wait. Jesus says, if we don't, if he doesn't stop this, nobody would be left alive on the planet. He's alluding to what Isaiah is describing, and you can read all of Isaiah 24 and 13 we're going to go to. He says there is such a scorching, a burning, a devastation that few men, humans, mankind are left. Few compared to the vast number. Now, easily, the Bible says half of everybody on this planet are killed in the tribulation. But that's just trying to add together that a third here and a quarter there. And, you know, you just get these just huge devastations going on. But God's reckoning is there are few humans left alive. Now, let's back up to chapter 13, verse 9. So we're backing through the Bible. Look at, at Isaiah 13. An interesting, another interesting parallel, if you like similarities. Mark 13 contains the same images as Isaiah 13. And Matthew 24 has the same images as, as Isaiah 24. So it's just interesting. Uh, and again, I don't think that has anything to do with inspiration. It has everything to do with um, us numbering the different chapters. But look at what it says in verse 9. Behold, and I told you last time, the day of the Lord, that's, that's Old Testament for the end, the second coming, this whole period, this, this climactic seven years punctuated in the middle by the event of Daniel 9 and going through the last half with all these horrific things. Behold, the day of the Lord, verse 9, is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger. So there's this burning anger to make the land a desolation. And now listen. And he will exterminate. Have you ever exterminated something? I mean, extermination is a very, that is a strong word. God is exterminating its sinners from it. He, he's exterminating people from this planet. For the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not flash their light. The sun will be dark when it rises. The moon will not shed its light. Doesn't that sound just like what we've been reading in chapter 13 and in chapter 24, 13 of Mark, 24 of Matthew, 21 of Luke? Same thing, that, that something's going to happen. The sun is not going to be as bright. The moon is going to look like blood. The, it's going to look like the stars are falling from heaven. And Luke says, while all this stuff's happening, people are apsukamai. 
Interesting Greek word. Only time it's used is in Luke 21. And it means that their breath just goes, and they die. They are scared literally to death. Not just burned, not just drowned and poisoned and murdered, but they apsukamai, they pop. They, their life goes out of them. It's so scary. This is what he's talking about. But keep reading. Thus, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. Now look at this. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind, it's implied, is, is more scarcer than the gold of Ophir. Chapter 24, there are going to be few people left, God says. Chapter 13, man is going to be scarcer than the best gold. That means it's going to be hard to find a living person. There's going to be so much death, so much destruction. In each of these Old Testament passages, the final judgment of Christ's return is the context. It's what's described. Each describes the very worst time in the history of the planet. But the key point of these two Isaiah prophecies that Jesus alludes to is that the survivors of the tribulation will be few. Few left alive. That's the, the common denominator. The description of the cause of death in this time period is primarily, in both passages, devouring fire that ravages both the earth and the people, both the land and the inhabitants. This devouring fire, it's in both passages. It both says that people are burned, that people are consumed, that people are dying in this fire. Now, go with me to the present. And I want to read to you from some newspapers, okay? Let's get out of the scriptures for a second and get into the newspapers, okay? Listen to this, because they're talking about, you know, where we are in the world. And for over 50 years, during what we now call the Cold War, neither of the superpowers ever thought that a nuclear exchange was winnable. We had the, the idea that, that it would be mutual annihilation, so why even do it? I mean, why even, let's just go on angry and threatening and not do it. And so that was kind of like the, the Cold War stalemate, that, that we wouldn't want to mutually assure the destruction of the planet. So that's why we got comfortable. We decided that we would never do that, us and the Soviets. And so we were just going to live and rattle our sabers and fly our bombers and, and go to code whatever, but we were never going to do that because it would just destroy. They knew that unleashing the fires of hell, as they were thought, those weapon, would poison and destroy life for everyone on the planet. History has even recorded that scientists who developed the Soviet weapons of mass destruction were willing to go into permanent exile in Siberia rather than to develop any further variations. I mean, that's history. In fact, I want to read to you General Ian... Uh, uh, Tsipa is his name. He defected from the so Soviet bloc, and now all these guys are making a fortune writing books. I want to read to you. This was just uh, last October in the Washington Times. I'm going to read two paragraphs of his book. Okay, this is this is a, a general that was in the, the the Air Force and was over in intelligence and with all the atomic stuff. This is what he says in his book. It's worth remembering that Andrei Sakharov, the father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb, chose to live in a Soviet gulag instead of continuing to develop the power of death. This guy went to Siberia. He said, I, I will not tie my hands. I will not work anymore. I will not help you. He says, you've got enough. It's too bad. He, he, Sakharov wrote this in 1968. I wanted to alert the world to the grave perils, the threatening of the human race, that thermonuclear extinction and ecological catastrophe and famine would bring because of the after effects of thermonuclear weapons. This writer goes on, this General Pasifa, he said even Igor Kurchatov, the KGB academician, uh, who expressed... Uh, this deep qualm in his conscience about helping create. He was, by the way, he was a KGB guy from 43 when the Soviets first 
started understanding this and, and got the, the, the technology started until 1960. This guy ran the program from 43 to 60, this, this Igor fella. And this is what he wrote in 1960 at his death. He said this, the rate of growth of atomic explosive, this is in 1960. We heard in the testimony tonight that our testifier wasn't even alive then. So, I mean, this is a long time ago, okay? 1960, this is what he said. The rate of growth of ex atomic explosives is such that in just a few years, the stockpile will be large enough to create conditions under which the existence of life will be impossible. And that's why this guy wouldn't help anymore either in 1960. Sakharov quit, went to a gulag. This Pasipa guy said, I can't help you anymore. It's, it's too dangerous. This is 1960 and 1968. That was a warning way back then. How is it today? We're all disarmed, right? We're paying the Soviets to get rid of those missiles, aren't we? Uh-huh. Are they getting rid of them? No. They've just developed far more powerful, far more deadly, far more lethal, far more mobile, far more accurate, far more long-lifed armaments. Today, the Russian military has more weapons that are more powerful, more deployable, and more indefensible than at any time in the past. They have mobile ones now. They have huge mobile ones. They have them on rail cars. They have them on trucks. We never know where they are. You can't track all those trucks all the time because they have decoy trucks and they have tunnels. They run them through miles long with multiple exits. And they can be under these hardened tunnels and then pop out at any time and just crank those things up and shoot them off with multiple independent re-entry warheads targeted today. Amazing. So that's Russia. Today, China is busily building atomic weapons. Already they have them armed and they can launch missiles that can strike here in the U.S., China. So Russia can hit us, China can hit us, much worse than 1960 and 1968. Today, the cruel and murderous regime of North Korea. Remember the regime that has starved its own people? There are over a million people in starvation in Korea because they're using all their resources on their atomic reactors that are for peacetime electrical production. But they're starving the people to, to make those work. And today, uh, this cruel and murderous and irresponsible regime in North Korea has both nuclear warheads and missiles that could strike the U.S. and Europe. I mean, it used to just be Russia versus the U.S. Today, the generations of hatred and hostility that smolder between Pakistan and India have come to the frightening climax. If you read the newspaper, both sides now have atomic-tipped missiles pointing at each other. And... Both have publicly stated that an atomic weapon attack on the enemy is a winnable option as far as the Pakistanis and the Indians are concerned. They said in India, we've got 1.2 billion people, you know, <laughs> you know, what's a few, you know, million gone? I mean, they didn't say it that, that crassly, but that's what they mean. Pakistan's the same. They actually have a scenario that they think it's winnable to launch missiles at each other, atomic weapons. In months, if not weeks, the bitterest enemy of the nation of Israel, the home of the dark prince of Persia, Iran itself, will have a growing arsenal of thermonuclear death and destruction in place. They already have the missiles. And they, the, the, the Israelis, with all their satellites, have confirmed that these missiles have a range, a range that can strike with atomic weapons, any part, not only of Israel, but of all of the Gulf area and even into Europe, the Iranians. And the Iranian version of Islam considers, quote, martyrdom for the cause of Allah to be the ultimate act of faith. Now, to be involved in a nuclear exchange that ensures a mutual destruction is an acceptable option to the mad mullahs of Tehran. If Iran gets nuclear weapons, you can be sure they will eagerly share them with the other fanatical Muslim nations. I mean, that's just a given. 
And with nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, it's possible to wipe out all flesh on earth. What happens? Let's go to Zechariah 14, okay? Let me read to you an on-the-site report of a nuclear exchange, okay? I think that's what, what Zechariah was seeing in Zechariah 14. Remember where that is? You go to Matthew and back up to Malachi and go back to Zechariah. It's just before the New Testament. Because the prophet who wrote his book of prophecies as he looked over the burned out rubble of Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem 2,500 years ago, that prophet, Zechariah, said this. And this is, this is a, a precise medical description of what happens to people who are in the battlefield or in the city that are within the radius of the blast and effects of an atomic device. This is what it says in 14.1. And this shall be the plague which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets. Their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. And I want to read you a little article from Caltech here before we go, just for good sleeping. Okay, this will help you. This is some, you know, uh, tonight. This will help you go to sleep. Um, Atomic weapons melt or dissolve their victims, just as Zechariah predicted 2,500 years ago. Now, this is from a Caltech uh, chat site or a blog site. It's widely believed and discussed at, at Caltech, California Institute of Technology, that Israel has developed an even more lethal version of atomic weaponry. They have taken the technology since the Jewish... Atomic scientists are the one that thought of this, as in Einstein and others, all these brilliant Jews. They have perfected far beyond the American neutron bomb because they don't have much space. And this is what, this is what uh, Caltech says. Um, by the way, the neutron bomb is the, the, in terms of destroying human beings, is the ultimate weapon. And I'll quote it here. The enhanced neutron weapon that Israel seems to have absolutely demolishes all protein-bearing living things in a predetermined area from 1 to 100 square miles without destroying buildings and terrain. Amazing. Don't hurt the buildings. You know, just kill the people. Amazing where we've come to. And this is exactly, look back at, at chapter 12 of Zechariah, because this is fitting into a very familiar scenario that the Bible has portrayed for a long time, and that is that Israel is going to be pinned to the wall, and they are going to unleash what they've already declared, which is called their Samson option. Remember, Samson brought the temple down on himself of Dagon. Rather, you know, he, he, rather than survive, he killed himself with his enemies, and that is the, the proclaimed doctrine of the Israeli military. They will not again lose and be destroyed. So they'll, they'll go down with the building. Zechariah 12, verses 2 and 3. When the final siege of Jerusalem happens, the outcome will not be what the nations of the earth had planned. God says the destroyers of his people will be destroyed. Verse 2. Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a, a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 3. When it happens in that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all people. Here it is. All who would heave it away will be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. It's very possible that this describes the unleashing of the destructive power that Zechariah saw in chapter 14. The melting armies advancing on Jerusalem, the final siege. Well, what are we to make of this? Why do we, we're not even going to be here. We're going to be with the Lord. Well, let me conclude with this, and this is where we'll pick up, Lord willing, next week. The Hebrew Bible has four different words for hope. Clinging hope, waiting hope, um, establishing hope, and sheltering hope. Just four different Hebrew words. They're the most graphic words. You know, Paul says the God of hope, more saved in hope. Did you know the Hebrew Scriptures describe what we are supposed to be living as we see the world marshaled against God's people, as we see the events lining up for the end. What are we supposed to be doing? Getting afraid? Building bomb shelters? Getting gold for when money gets worthless? Well, I mean, do whatever is necessary. But you know what? We are supposed to be captured, captivated, surrounded, overflowing with this hope. This hopeless world we live in 
He's supposed to see hope-filled believers. And that's where we'll pick up next time and actually see what we're supposed to do while the world is preparing for the worst time ever. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, I thank you that we were saved in hope. And that we can have hope as an anchor of our souls. And that's why we meet to study your word, to see what the end looks like, so we can share it with others and say we have hope in this hopeless time. And that's why we send our teams forth. And that's why we train uh, evangelists. And that's why we pass out tracts, because we believe in you, the God of hope, who have anchored our souls in heaven. And we will not be lost. And we will not perish one day early or linger one day too long. May we live. May we serve. May we go in hope. In the precious name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.